morning. Our scripture passage this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Today's sermon is going to be all about a number, and it's not the number 500, but I, it's a number that I want you to burn into your brain and to think about and to ponder as you leave this place today. It is the number 96. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but even if you took advantage of everything that there was to do at this church, if you came every single Sunday to worship, which is a really good idea, and you stayed every single week for SCL, every week you attended a small group or in a different committee meeting every single week, and then went to a potluck Presbyterians to boot, or else you went and helped us as we crush some poor, unknowing church in our softball league, even if you did all of that, just about every week, that would probably only take up about 4% of your life. Which means that the other 96% of your Christian commitment is lived outside the walls of this church. And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, although we are going to have sign-ups for committees out on the patio today. No, I'm just kidding. But I want you to think about that, because if you are a person who has given your life to God, if you are a person who has entrusted your life and your future to this man, Jesus of Nazareth, then that means that 96% of your life, of your Christian faith, is conducted out there, out in the world, away from these people and away from this place. As we've just been talking, this is the 500th year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, 2017, 500 years since that fated day when Martin Luther brought his 95 complaints to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg and nailed them up, trying to point out the excesses and the corruption in the Catholic Church, which was the only church at the time. Actually, Orst is going to get really upset with me for saying that. There was the Orthodox Church as well, but sort of, for all we knew, the only church at the time. And started this revolution that he had no intention of starting. He was trying to reform the church from the inside at, from the inside at first, but that would ultimately lead, they're going from being one or almost one denomination to at last count over 33,000. And as they were starting this, this new revolution, this new idea, they decided that it was probably a better idea to have things that they were for rather than things that they were against. It's really hard to put 95 complaints onto a business card. And so they came up with five core fundamental beliefs of what they did affirm. The whole idea was that they wanted to try to strip away all of the extra traditions and customs and beliefs and superfluous stuff that was outside of the core gospel message. And so what they talked about is that there were five things alone, five things that stood on their own that dictated our salvation. And so they called them the five solas, the sola being the Latin word for alone. And so there was Sola gratia, grace alone, that we get salvation through grace alone. Sola fide, through faith alone. Sola Christos, through Christ alone. Sola Biblia, through the Bible alone. And then the last one, which sort of sets the foundation and wraps the rest of them together, is Sola Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. And this was, this was the foundation. This was the one that underlined everything else, that whatever we do and whatever we do in our faith and in our lives and out there in the world and in here in the church, it's meant only to bring glory to God and God alone. Which brings us back to the 96. How are you doing these days with your 96? How are you doing with bringing 
glory to God in the everyday, every moments, day in, day out, mundane meetings and interactions of your life. You know, I get it. It's not easy. Especially in a day and age like this, in a city like the one we live in. I think we've become like Pavlov's dog or those rats that get shocked in the psychology experiments. It becomes really easy for us to be con become conditioned really quickly to not say anything or express our faith in any way out there in public. So much of our world, so much of our city is skeptical, if not downright hostile, towards any kind of display of faith. And yet the truth of the matter is that the, the bedrock of this faith of ours, it's that it's something that affects all of us, every bit of us, every moment of us from the inside out. This is who we are. This is too important for it to be, for it to be tied in to just a couple hours a week. We need God's grace and God's forgiveness. We need God's direction and comfort and challenge and inspiration every moment of every single day. Isn't that true? Johann Sebastian Bach, the great composer, he was really committed to trying to make sure that people understood that every part of his life was in service to God, that he believed that these great gifts of music that he had been given came from God and that the only appropriate use for his gifts were to bring glory back to God. I don't know if you all have seen before, but he used to sign every single one of his compositions with S-D-G. Can you see it there? S-D-G. Sola Deo Gloria. All for the glory of God. Christian Huff is a, is a Broadway star. I think he's most well-known these days for his starring role that he played in Jersey Boys. I don't know if you all know who he is. But in his playbill, he actually writes in his little biography, he talks about his life and his career, and the last thing he says is, but my most cherished role in life has always been to be a loving husband and father. Parentheses, sola deo gloria. He wants people to know that he lives his whole life as a disciple of Christ, that these incredible gifts that he's always being given glory for, that he's always being praised for, actually come straight from God, and that, that the only one who deserves the credit for anything that people praise him for is God, who gives him everything that he is and everything that he does. And this brings up an interesting, kind of awkward, weird thing that Christians sometimes do. It's especially prevalent here in the church, and that's those who want to take this idea seriously, and so they're very adamant about making sure that no one thanks them for anything or expresses any kind of gratitude or appreciation for anything, and we see it a lot in certain Christian circles, maybe not so much here, but I've always felt kind of awkward. When I'm standing at the line in, in the door and someone comes by and compliments my sermon, it happens sometimes. <laughs> Is it okay to say, gosh, thank you? Or do you have to say, <laughs> all praise to God, to the glory of God, we see it especially, it's a phenomenon we see all the time here around our music program, right? Because with a music program as spectacular as it is, oftentimes when the music ends, we just spontaneously want to express our appreciation and our gratitude for the gifts that they're showing up here. Now, in a lot of churches, that would be blasphemous. I mean, this would be anathema. The church that I was coming from in Morristown, this very sort of high church, I think if anyone had clapped after a moving anthem or a particularly touching solo, they probably would have been dragged out into the church parking lot and shot. But here, so often, when, when we hear beautiful music, we want to express our appreciation. And our belief is that we believe that if Jesus was sitting here in the pews, Jesus would be the first one to start clapping, right? 
that it doesn't take anything away from us wanting to be up here pointing the praise and the glory up to God, but that as God's people, we appreciate and we see and we're thankful for those who use their gifts in beautiful ways to try to help us to draw closer to God. We believe that God is more concerned that the world doesn't show each other enough appreciation and enough affirmation and that God has plenty of room for all of it to be expressed. It's an interesting thing, but it brings up the question. I loved when Michelle said that she wasn't sure exactly what glory meant because I wasn't either, even going into this sermon. And so I looked it up and I studied and tried to figure out what it means too, and it actually means a number of different things. We see the word glory being used a lot in the Old and the New Testament. And oftentimes when we see it, it has to do with sort of a honor or respect or even a fame among people, like what we see in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory, the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Or here in Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. Of Lebanon. It's this idea that that the glory of God is this majesty, this power, this awe and reverence that we have for God. But then in other times, we see that the glory of God seems to be talking about an actual physical light, like a, a physical radiance or a bright light that, that literally glows from a person. I don't know if you remember uh, during the birth narrative when the angel comes to the shepherds out in the fields, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. We see it's sort of similar with Moses. I don't know if you remember, every time Moses came into God's presence, his face would literally glow with God's glory, right? This this bright, radiant light that the Israelites couldn't even look at because it was too bright and too holy. So it's both of these things, but then we also see that, especially in the Exodus story, they talk about God's glory as somehow God's physical presence with us. They talk about God's glory as being the thing that shows up as a cloud during the day that would lead them during the days and a pillar of fire that would lead them during the nights. Many of you have heard that term, Shekinah glory. Shek is the Hebrew word, Hebrew word which means settle or dwell. And so the glory of God comes to break into our human world and to settle amongst us and dwell amongst us and be with us. You know, it's interesting in Exodus when they use this word for glory throughout the book of Exodus, they use the Hebrew word chabad. Can everyone say that with me? Chabad. If you're saying it right, you'll spray a fine little mist on the neck of the person in front of you. Chabad is the word which originally, before the Exodus, it was a word which actually meant something more like weight or burden. Weight or burden. And yet, throughout the Exodus, the Chabad of God, this presence of God, the glory of God, was something that rested with the people. And the, and the reason they use that word is because there's something about having God in your presence that's weighty, isn't it? It's got a certain heft to it, a certain weightiness, a certain strength to it. And so we see that when people were in the presence of God, there was fear going on. Remember the shepherds. It said that the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were what? In the King James Version, sore afraid, right? And so it's all of these things. It's, it's God's fame and beauty and splendor and majesty. It's God's radiance and brightness, the power 
that comes, this illuminosity that comes through God's presence. It is God's presence that indwells and breaks in and lives amongst us. Basically, God's glory is any time that God's presence breaks through that thin veil that separates this world and the next, where God's presence breaks through into our everyday interactions and our everyday moments and comes and changes the situation and brings something special, something weighty, something with heft into the situation. And we all know what that's like, don't we? It happens here in worship often, doesn't it? When suddenly something unrehearsed takes place, and all of a sudden it's like we all feel it at the same moment, don't we? We get chills as something breaks through and we feel that God's presence is here in a way that we could have never planned and was, didn't happen when we were doing our rehearsals, but it happens when we're here together. And it happens outside of worship as well. You know in your lives you've had that experience as you've looked out over the ocean or at a sunset or been sitting with friends or family around a dinner table or been there with someone at a time of loss or a time of great difficulty and all of a sudden it feels like God's presence breaks through and starts to glow or radiate. God's glory comes through into that situation. Which means that another way of understanding this concept of sola deo gloria, a deeper way of understanding it, is that sola deo gloria is a commitment in our life for looking for the opportunities where God's glory, where God's presence can break through into the other 96% of our lives. To be intentional about trying to see that story that, that goes underneath the story. That spiritual thread, that invisible spiritual thread which wraps around and under and over and through every relationship and every moment and every interaction in our life. Sola Deo, Gloria, to God be the glory and, and God alone. This, is, this idea is, is our commitment to trying to see in all of the little interactions of our lives, every conversation, every phone call, every email that we write, every detour we have to take or, or disruption that we have in the course of our daily life, that in every one of those moments, we are committed to trying to see what God is up to in that moment where God is underneath that story, how God would want to use us to allow God's glory to break through into that everyday moment. And when it happens, it's like we become like Moses, like we literally glow with the love and the glory of God and Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians. He said, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, all of us are being transformed into him, his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What does it look like in your life to say, Sola Deo Gloria. To God and God alone be the glory. Frederick Buechner, one of my favorite authors, says it so well in a paragraph that he wrote about the Lord's nativity in the night that Jesus was born. He says, those who believe in God can never in a way ever be sure of him again. Once they have seen him in a stable, they can never be sure where he will appear or to what and I think, yeah, lengths he will go, go or to what ludicrous depths of self-humiliation he will descend in his wild pursuit of humankind. If holiness and the awful power and majesty of God were present in this least auspicious of all events, this birth of a peasant's child, then there is no place or time so lowly and earthbound, but that holiness cannot be present there too. 
And this means that we are never safe. That there is no place where we can hide from God. No place where we are safe from his power to break into and recreate the human heart. Because it is just where he seems most helpless that he is most strong. And just where we least expect him that he comes most fully. So, can I challenge you this week to spend some time thinking about how you're doing with your 96%, where you're allowing God's glory to break through, where you're allowing God's power to come into your everyday moments, how in your life you try to take seriously this concept of sola deo gloria that this Protestant Reformation was founded on? Because it makes all the difference. It's not just for us. It doesn't just change our own lives. It's not just a way to serve God. It's a way to serve ourselves. It's a way to serve every single person around us. It makes life better. It makes life more meaningful and heavier and deeper. It gives life more heft and joy and passion when we allow ourselves to allow sola deo gloria to break in to our lives all the way along. Where in your life can you be a conduit for God's glory breaking through to the people around you? Amen.